hi, um, my name is Margaret Summerfield. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student in the English department and um, I'm currently teaching my elective, which is Infinite Nature and the Early Modern Imagination. Um, so one of my uh, research interests is eco-criticism um, and uh, my area of specialty is um, Renaissance literature. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today. <laughs> And I'm Scott Resnick. I'm a visiting assistant professor in the English department this year in American literature. Um, my scholarship revolves around 18th and 19th century American literature, um, typically the intersections of politics and, uh, uh, and literature. I do a lot with romanticism um, in particular and stuff, so hence why mm -hmm. uh, this exhibit in some ways uh, very much appealed to me. Um, at the moment, I'm teaching a course right now, uh, American Literary History II, which looks at American literature from the Civil War to World War I. Um, so not only does it overlap yeah. chronologically with the time that Richards is uh, painting during, mm -hmm. but we're talking a lot about um, the relationship between romanticism and realism, in particular mm -hmm. in literature, and how, that, how real, the push towards realism at the mm -hmm. end of the 20th century. Um, and so I thought, I have not yet brought my class here, but I thought it would be good to incorporate um, visual texts into our class. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess just to say a little bit about pedagogically, regardless of what class I teach, and I'm curious to hear, Margaret, uh -huh. about how you do this with your classes, I try to incorporate a, some sort of visual text into every class that I teach. Um, whether it's intro to literature or uh, next semester I'm teaching intro to American studies, so we'll definitely be doing um, painting and images and advertising and things uh -huh. like that. Um, but I, I do it because we tend to teach, we want to teach close reading and, and have students develop their skills mm -hmm. to look at and, and not just, you know, enjoy, but to analyze the text and try to figure out how it's working. And of course, in literature departments, we focus so much on written text, right? Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, I find it not only gives students a break uh -huh, right. uh, from reading poems and novels and journalism and mm -hmm. things like that to look at uh, paintings uh, and photographs and things like this, but it mm -hmm. also, I try to emphasize uh, how the kind of skills, the analytical skills that mm -hmm. we're reading text with, printed text, actually translate to visual texts mm -hmm. as well. And we live in a pretty image-saturated society these yeah. days, of course, so I feel like being able to recognize the fact that the images you see on Instagram and Pinterest and things like this are also mm -hmm. texts and they are saying things in certain ways. And mm -hmm. so actually getting students to develop the skills of being able to look at a composition and figure mm -hmm. out, rather than adjectives and, and meter and rhyme and things uh -huh. like this or character development, um, using the craft of, of visual art. So with painting color uh, and light, mm -hmm. uh, the tone that that sets and you know being able to have students actually talk about first of all what are they seeing and uh -huh. how do they put together what they're seeing mm -hmm. um, in some ways reinforces what we're doing with printed texts yeah I think um, so uh, at, at the same time I feel like it also helps them expand their interpretive abilities and mm -hmm. um, some of them have actually never really even not taken an art history course or anything like that but not uh -huh. thought about how does one look at a painting for instance and figure out what it's what it's saying or why you might be having the responses or the feelings yeah. that you're having and looking at it. So mm -hmm. I don't know the extent to which you yeah. bring them into into your literature classes. But. Yeah, um, that's actually really funny that you mention um, like how image saturated our culture is today and especially like advertising. Because um, I did have the opportunity recently. Uh, so um, the, a lot of the texts that I teach are from like 16th and 17th century like England and it feels very distant to them. So um, some of the things that I enjoy doing is to bring in some like um, basically like what you were, you were saying like how, how do we how can we apply the skills like the close reading skills that we've been learning in our class to the world around us today um, and especially like thinking of like through lines but also like ruptures between you know, 17th century England, you know, um, and like our culture today, you know, like 21st century America. And, um, and recently, you know, we were reading, um, like, uh, we were reading the, uh, this pamphlet about air pollution in London. Um, it was published in um, 1660. And we, uh, so after we sort of analyze the rhetorical strategies that this man, um, that the author is using in order to, you know, convince people, like, of the direness of the situation, you know, like, how bad air pollution is and what we should do about it, mm -hmm. um, we took a class to sort of think about, 
like modern day environmental like PSAs and and so we we got to and we got to use images you know because it's very like you know um, it's sort of a it seems to be very like image heavy it seems to be like what advertisers uh, kind of like are you know instead of like giving you because you know think about like you know billboards and like mm -hmm. commercials and stuff instead of dumping a lot of information at you you know they kind of like have to like catch your attention like really yeah. quickly so um, after thinking about the rhetorical strategies that you know this man is using in this you know informational pamphlet then we kind of like tried to you know think about like okay how is you know an advertisement also using similar rhetorical moves in order to get us to you know respond to something like in a particular emotional you know way and then what what are they asking us to do you know like yeah. whereas the author you know has is able to you know explain to us in words like what he you know specifically like okay next steps this is what we should do to like solve air pollution in london um you know nowadays like okay so who is this you know when we see like uh, an advertisement of like a sea turtle like you know like in a plastic bag you know mm, so like yep. a polar bear stranded on yeah ice cap. exactly <laughs> yeah so like who is this you know directed toward like who is the victim who is the perpetrator of mm -hmm. like this injustice that you know we've seen we see in this image and then but also like okay and then like now what you know like what are the next steps and that was trickier you know that was a difficult conversation to have sure. um yeah but so that was yeah that was really good and um yeah i really enjoy bringing in like the visual um because as you were saying before um there's a lot of even though they're very distinct you know like disciplines in some ways there's also a lot that you can like there's a lot of like communication between the two and a lot of like influence between the two um and you can sort of like use similar strategies to read a painting you know yeah in, yeah. My, in my literature core class we actually we, i mean we read um it's called uh, literature and politics from julius caesar uh -huh. to game of thrones so you can imagine it's a pretty popular course <laughs> sure. in a lot of respects i would um, take it <laughs> <laughs> um and, but in some ways you know we work from written texts, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Shakespeare, Herman Melville, uh -huh. uh, things like that, and then uh, Margaret Atwood's um, uh -huh. Handmaid's Tale. Um, but then we build up to the visual element of the course, cool. so we watch um, like an episode of House of Cards, um, oh, and then of course cool. we watch yeah. the first season of uh, Game of Thrones and, and mm -hmm. discuss that. But in order to build up to analyzing a television episode or uh -huh. a film, um, I start with painting, mm -hmm. because well, it's not moving, um, and it's a little <laughs> bit easier to, you know, you don't have to talk yeah. about character and narrative, and there's no sound and things like right. that. So really just starting with painting in the course yeah. and trying to figure out, okay, well, let's, let's start to engage mm -hmm. with visual text. You know, right. where does your eye go first, you know, right. and, then, and then where? And, you know, what, yeah. what do you make of, you know, the use of light and shadow and things like this? Mm -hmm. So, again, having students not only pay attention to what they see, but mm -hmm. how what they see has been put together and constructed. Right. Why do artists make certain choices mm -hmm. um, in, in portraying uh, the world to you? Mm -hmm. um, this uh, painting here, uh, I don't, I'm not even sure if I'm gonna get the pronunciation correctly here, but uh, Guernsey Cliffs, uh, the Channel mm -hmm. Islands, um, that Richards paint, uh, had painted. I, I thought this was a, a particular a particularly good piece to start with because um, one of the things we're talking about in amongst other things I guess in my American literary history class we are really looking at literature in relation to a lot of different social mm -hmm. um, issues and, and dilemmas at the time so of mm -hmm. course right after the Civil War you have the issue of race and reconstruction uh, the rise of industrialism immigration all kinds of other things but this mm -hmm. what else is going on too is trying to understand uh, humanity's relationship to the natural world uh -huh. um, yeah the national parks are actually starting to come into existence at this time period. That's the, so the thought that yeah. um, actually setting aside tracts of land mm -hmm. might be an important thing right. for uh, for people to do, yeah. um, and but really rethinking um, the uh, humankind's relationship to the natural world. Uh -huh. And so we read a whole bunch of uh, of literature that deals with this. Um, but visually, I mean, this painting in particular, I think is is striking because um, it's it almost looks, could be a photograph yeah. in a lot of respects, mm -hmm. right? So you have, if you were to vacation here, this would be very much, you could post this on Instagram and it would be a <laughs> yeah. hit instantly, your family would love it. Um, so it really looks, at, it's almost that journalistic photographic approach yeah. in terms of accuracy and I, I'm amazed at the way that Richards uh, tries to capture every little nook and cranny of the cliffs. Yeah. Uh, there's a 
uh, one of the captions to the paintings here. It's, it's as if he, somebody criticized him essentially as trying to bring, trying to paint every rock that uh -huh. was uh, existed on the mountainside. <laughs> um, and so it has that like photographic and really realist detail yeah. of let me you know let me show you what's really there. But then the the drama of this painting, mm -hmm. um, the waves, the kind of this this force, the, this uh, the sense of, of of the force of nature with the clouds and the use of, uh, of kind of light and shadow mm -hmm. over here on the, on the right-hand side of the painting, and just the, the force of this water coming in creates this feeling that goes beyond mere mm -hmm. realism and really starts that, in some ways, go back to the kind of the romantic strains yeah. in a lot of ways that exist in, in some of the other paintings uh -huh. that are here in this collection. This idea of foregrounding, first and foremost, nature itself, right. a very romantic idea, uh -huh. and suggesting that it has this power to it mm -hmm. um, that you know, goes back to you know, poets like, uh, of course, Wordsworth and Shelley, um, I think, in, uh -huh. in particular. Um, and then on the American, uh, the American side, uh, in writings like Emerson and Thoreau trying to capture um, nature as this this elemental force in the in the world yeah. in the universe that needs to be understood. So uh, there's this tension in this painting between mm -hmm. realism and and romanticism that kind yeah. of immediately drew me, and I thought, well, this will be great to talk about with students um, mm -hmm. and try to make connections to some of the written texts um, that we've that we've studied. So yeah, no, absolutely, and um, I think that. Um, I mean, like what you say, like when you were talking about like the realism versus romanticism, I was kind of, I was surprised when I like read a little bit about uh, Richards and, you know, found out that he, he was, you know, you know, sort of pulling, pushing against the romanticism of, you know, some of like the Hudson River Valley School and stuff like that. Yeah, because I was like looking at these paintings and I was so like, I was kind of filled with the similar, you know, emotions, like the awe and the, you know, kind of like the, the humility, I guess, that, that the romantics are really getting toward. Um, and so, yeah, I was sort of, I was, I agree that it's, it's a hard distinction to make for me at least, mm -hmm. um, you know, between realism and romanticism. Yeah. Um, and especially here, I mean, yeah, like the drama that you say, like, you know, I mean, I look at these waves and I mean, it's just so, like, you can actually, like, kind of see them heaving, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, there's a real, like, there's so much motion in this painting, and, I mean, the way that he's, like, using light and the fog in the distance, mm -hmm. I mean, like, the translucency of the waves, I mean, it's it's really incredible. Um, and it really, like, it really brings you there. Like, you can kind of hear the crash of the waves. Oh, my gosh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really, really exciting. Yeah. Um, and you're right, there are other paintings here, too, yeah. that, I mean, I think you're right, bring uh -huh. out the, the romantic elements of him yeah. and, and the drama of a scene like this mm -hmm. with the elemental forces in some ways of of uh, you know water and earth kind yeah. of coming together yeah this colliding conflict, right it's yeah. a little bit more tame here but it nevertheless that drama yeah. is still is still very much there i yeah. think in his uh in his aesthetics so. mm -hmm. um now when when you bring in um visual art of yeah. any form mm -hmm. to uh, to your own classes. I'm curious, because you mentioned uh, in our discussion before, like ideas of pastoralism and, yeah. and things like this. That's I'm right. curious to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, so yeah, explaining like sort of like what pastoralism is and how it kind of like lingers, like that we still have these ideas of pastoralism like today with, you know, the idea of, you know, like, um, like manicured lawns and yeah and like <laughs> yes. the the food the the farm to table movement yeah like yes. that's also very like pastoral and kind of like trying to go back to this um this idealized uh this ideal nature that probably that well definitely never existed you know so you're <laughs> <laughs> and it's always and it's kind of fascinating because like with each so you know nowadays like we're like oh you know we're, we're so like detached from you know from nature you know mm -hmm. we're so like isolated from it um but that was also a complaint you know in the 1600s you know we have lost our touch with nature mm -hmm. and um, and of course Wordsworth talked about that right yeah of course For sure. and then yeah and then like even farther back than that but you go as far back as like um you know the um like Virgil like Virgil is already talking about like how we've lost our touch with nature and that's like going back thousands of noticing years noticing a trend exactly <laughs> so like we're always like trying to like reclaim something that we feel that you know like only a generation ago we had but it's yes. like yeah it's like always receding <laughs> this lost moment when we were really in touch with nature exactly and yeah now it's gone yeah and in the on the American side too you see it with um Emerson and and Thoreau, That's right, of course, Thoreau, in certain yeah. respects, and the, mm -hmm. especially Emerson, they have this really kind of like benevolent understanding yeah. of the natural world. That if yeah. you just get 
back in touch with it, everything will be right. uh, truly wonderful, yeah. I guess, in, in certain respects. They, like Emerson has kind of no conception of evil, right? <laughs> right. It's the sense that there might be forces uh, in nature beyond uh, this. Whitman, mm-hmm. in his poetry, suggests uh-huh. this a bit. And then um, in some of the texts we're reading in my American literary history class mm-hmm. this semester, um, you're definitely, we, we start to see it especially in uh, Stephen Crane. We actually, I should just oh. taught this uh, text today, uh-huh. uh, The Open Boat, um, which is a, a, a story uh-huh. from, uh, that he wrote uh, about describing the travails of four men who are trying to survive the open ocean uh-huh. in a little uh, lifeboat. Oh my God, um, yeah. In like most naturalist stories of the time, it does not go well. Mm. Um, but this <laughs> idea that nature is this powerful force yeah. in you that uh, is fundamentally at odds in some ways with humankind's ability to even understand. The opening line of the story uh-huh. is, none of the men knew the color of the sky. Uh, suggesting their limited ability to perceive yeah. the natural world in all of its intensity and and ferocity, and it's yeah. uh, it's just a short story, but it's rather exhausting to read it as they're constantly fighting the waves and yeah. um, attributing to nature. I guess the, the literary term would be the mm-hmm. pathetic fallacy. So yeah. attributing to nature something like wrath, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Um, or at the end of this, right, what comes to find out is that no, what no one wants to talk about is the fact that nature might not care about humanity. Right, uh, yeah, because the indifference, in the that's so scary. <laughs> yes. Right, yeah. Uh, which is a, sort of a, a truly terrifying yeah. thing. Um, and so really pushing back, one of the other readers were, uh, one of the other writers we're reading in the course is John Muir, uh-huh. who uh, is uh, living in the p- uh-huh. uh, Pacific Northwest at the time and um, living in Yosemite National Park mm-hmm. uh, and in the, the Cascades region and hiking and really actually bringing a lot of awareness mm-hmm. to, uh, to the country about the natural treasures that do exist in uh-huh. the United States. And he used, uses journalism and writing to advocate for setting aside these tracts of land as right. valuable in and of themselves. And he often does write about nature as uh-huh. if it's this, um, you know, kind of harmless sort of thing. It even yeah. says at one point in one of his writings that the real danger is in society. You know, once you oh. get used to the customs of the social world, that's where the real danger is. <laughs> Everybody wants to talk about snakes and bears, but you know, for the most part, nature is, you're way more <laughs> safe there than you are in the natural world, right? Um, but the, again, writers like Crane and uh-huh. even Herman Melville uh, suggesting, and I, again, I think you see this in Richard's work, mm-hmm. uh, in a number of, of, uh, of his works here, this kind of power that is uh, intense and probably might not care about you yeah. as a human individual and spectator. <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, one, uh, my my students actually had to write a paper recently about you know um, a, com- a couple of the pastoral poems that we read, and um, two of the poems that they could have written about um, were you know Marlowe's "The Passionate Shepherd to His Love." Oh yeah, uh, yeah, right. Come away with me and be my love, and um, and then Raleigh's reply to that, um, and. And they were really about the worms and the yeah, in the grave, and about right? the, exactly about <laughs> yeah. how like that that Marlowe's or you know the speaker of Marlowe's poem is you know portraying nature as like this very passive um, welcoming space that you know kind of like that the the shepherd and his love can run away to and they can just like really I mean you know ironically like even though he is a shepherd he never seems to work as a shepherd you know he can just sort of like lay back and you know enjoy you know like watch the other shepherds work and um and so nature is this very yeah like a a very sort of like a safe like a tame nature Mm -hmm. and Raleigh um who uh who genders the lover as as a as a shepherdess like as a nymph um Mm -hmm. as is replying to uh to the shepherd and and part of it is you know kind of like a you know like can't trust men sort of like lesson (laughs) but but also um careful exactly yeah be very careful you know honeyed words and everything um but also this this idea that um that this that this conception of nature that he has is impossible. It doesn't exist. Um, and I mean, there's this one line that um, he, he t- she talks about, like the fields to wayward winter reckoning yields. And I love, I mean, personally, I love that line. I just like love the rhythm of it. And I love how like you can just like hear like the fields, like the wind blowing through the fields. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and that these things like that, that nature is change, you know, that it's constantly in flux and that the nature that welcomes you in one day will be pushing you out the next, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and like the sort of the real dangers that are there. 
Um, but and yeah. What more, like, again, kind of long scale sense <laughs> of change yes, in some ways, yeah. right, than water on rock. Exactly. Uh, which is tough to capture in the moment the way he does know, with this. Unreal. But you, but nevertheless, you get the, the sense of this. And it's actually just striking me now, mm -hmm. too. The other painting I think we're going to talk about a little bit, um, if we can, is the shipwreck mm. um, that he painted. But there's this similar diagonal in both of these compositions, here uh -huh. with the waves, mm -hmm. um, and then in the other painting we'll see it with the actual ship itself, yeah. uh, that kind of like cuts through the action here yeah. uh, and lends this, like, this sense of, of drama, again, the force uh, of water on rock, yeah. uh, kind of leading to, you know, you have that dark cavern That's right, right there, yeah, which the water you know, just down. suggests... Um, mystery and something uh -huh. kind of incommunicable yeah um, but also like the the height and drama of the cliffs themselves again right. the sharp diagonals and uh the imposing nature of this uh again this this idea of time mm -hmm. and change on a scale that for human beings is very difficult to yeah. imagine right um, in some ways which again brings us back to the the, the, the moment in which we're currently living yes. and having to reckon in some ways with yeah. this, uh, this scale that exists beyond us. So. Yeah.